the Rockies are right over there. Don't just go to the conference. Go and see the Rocky Mountain National Park. Go hiking up at Bear Lake or something. Don't do what I did, which is just to come for the conference. Go and see the area. Hey everyone, I'm gonna get started because it's quarter after three. Um, thank you all for coming to my talk. Today I'll be talking about STD LinAlg, which is a linear algebra library that hopefully is coming to standard C++. My name is Mark Homan. Um, I work for NVIDIA and I'm glad that you all came today, thank you. So we'll start with a motivating example showing how to do dense matrix matrix multiply and then we'll show how our proposed library STD LinAlg fits in the layers of linear algebra. And I'll explain what those layers mean in a bit. I'll then show how LinAlg builds on the existing C++ standard library functionality, and also how it builds on the long history of something called the BLAS, the basic linear algebra subroutines. And finally, I'll end with a detailed example uh, performing Cholesky matrix factorization with our proposed library. So here's a motivating example. Suppose that we want to do a dense matrix matrix multiply updating. So we want to do some scalar constant beta times the matrix C plus a scalar constant alpha times the matrix A times the matrix B transpose. That little T superscript, that means the transpose, so you flip it over the diagonal. And the code on the left shows state of the art current practice. So in C++, we don't have a standard library in the C++ standard library for doing this. And so what we have to do is call some kind of optimized Fortran library. In fact, we're calling something called the BLAS that I'll explain in a bit. But it's a Fortran library. So you can't just call it from C++. You have to declare it as an extern C library. And Fortran compilers have different ways of mangling Fortran functions. A common one is lowercase with an, a trailing underscore. So you hope that your Fortran compiler does that, and you're calling this function with a really weird name called dgem, what does that stand for? And it takes a bunch of arguments, it takes a bunch of integers by pointer, which is weird because Fortran 77 doesn't do pass by value. And we're doing something extremely weird with the arguments here. We want to do A times B transpose, but our matrices are C++ matrices they default to row major layout because C++, C, they share that multidimensional arrays are in row major. Fortran libraries like column major matrices. And so we have to flip everything over. And when you flip a matrix product, you reverse the order of the matrices in the matrix product. So it's actually C transpose equals a, a B times A transpose. It's very, very confusing. And after using our library, you get the code on the right, which is one line, two if you can count the include. So now I'll have a little bit of an interlude. I'd like to um, give credit to Rene Magritte for his uh, The Treachery of Images. Um, that's not a pipe. It is actually a picture of a pipe. But. So does a linear algebra library really do linear algebra? Is it, our, linear, our linearity of linear algebra libraries is somewhat aspirational. So there are two reasons why it's a little bit iffy for us even to say linear algebra library. The first reason is we're talking about vectors and matrices. We're using these math words, but really these are just arrays. So we say vector, we mean rank one array. We say matrix, we mean rank two matrix. We're ignoring the fact that a vector is really coordinates in some basis of a vector space, that a matrix is a linear function, that it has, and, and if you have the coordinates of the matrix, you have two different bases. There's a second reason why it's, it's, this linearity is aspirational. And it's that matrices are supposed to be linear functions. These need to be linear things. And that depends on a lot of different properties of the mathematics. For example, that the scalars are in a field, that addition is associative. All that stuff goes away when we deal with floating point numbers, when we deal with integers, when we deal with fixed length numbers in our computer representation. 
And it turns out that the architects of the first electronic computers cared very deeply about whether any of this linear algebra makes sense to do on a computer, given rounding error, given saturation, given overflow. Alan Turing himself wrote on this topic. And it turns out that there's a, a good amount of theory that supports doing what we call linear algebra, even though it's not really linear. And there's a sort of convention for doing this. Um, I'm referring here to the Householder Convention. That's a standard notation for writing linear algebra operations. For example, that matrices are in all caps, and that vectors are lowercase, and that scalars are in Greek letters. We call this the Householder Convention. But I'm generalizing this to say it's a standard way of talking about computations, that we use math words, but we mean their computer representation. And I show Householder here, Alson Scott Householder, was a, really a unifier of the field of numerical linear algebra. He actually has undergraduate and master's degrees in philosophy. His, his, his PhD is in um, mathematical biology, and he worked in that area for a while. And he really helped define the problems of the field and also the notation. So his 1964 textbook is how we have this notation that we have today. Linear algebra comes in layers, layers of abstraction. And so when we talk about a linear algebra library, we, we want to talk about its responsibilities. We have to think of those layers. Um, so the hope is that they don't stink and they don't make you cry, just like onions. But. So I've drawn out uh, four different layers here of what a linear algebra library can do. And even before we talk about arrays of numbers or matrices or vectors, we have to build, we have to have the data structures and the means to, to talk about that. And so layer minus one really is a basement level. The fundamentals are multidimensional arrays and iteration. But we build upon that a set of what we call performance primitives. And we could talk about those in terms of vector operations like dot products and norms adding vectors together, doing plane rotations. We could talk about operations that mix matrices and vectors. So for example, matrix vector multiply, triangular solve, outer product updates. We could talk about operations that involve one or more matrices. Matrix multiply, triangular solve with multiple vectors, symmetric matrix updates, things like that. And we use that level of performance primitives and we build upon that to solve the lowest level of math problems that we still recognize as linear algebra problems. So the, classically, those are the three categories of solving linear systems. Along with that comes things like determinants, solving linear least squares problems, and also solving eigenvalue problems and singular value problems. Those are really the, the fundamental problems of what we call linear algebra. And we build upon those higher level uh, solutions for higher level math problems. Um, we use these, these tools a lot in statistical inference, in physics simulations, even solving other linear algebra problems. Many of them can be reduced to um, smaller versions of the lower level level one problems. And so what existing features of the C++ standard cover these different layers? So for multidimensional arrays and iteration, we do have features. For example, um, C++17 introduces the parallel algorithms. In C++23, um, we have MD span, a multidimensional array view. And in C++26, we have sub MD span, which lets you slice MD span. There are also proposals in flight. MD array is the container analog of MD span. Um, there are new layouts being proposed for MD span. And you may have seen Matthias Kretz's uh, SIMD proposal. Um, that he gave a talk on yesterday. Those are parts of, of layer one that we have already in the standard library or hopefully will have soon. Layer one is the classic domain of numerical linear algebra. There are Fortran libraries that solve these problems. For example, LAPAC. There are no C++ standard proposals in flight as far as I know to solve these problems, but there are many third party C++ libraries that do. For example, like our very own MADX, um, Eigen and Armadillo. And today, we're going to talk about our proposed library, um, Linalg. 
And this library provides these layer zero performance primitives, and it focuses on that. So why do we separate out linear algebra into layers like this? Um, what we really want to do with these layers is to separate these performance primitives from the mathematical algorithms that consume them. And we do that for three different reasons. First, a lot of these performance primitives, if you do them badly, if you implement them naively, you get asymptotically slower performance in terms of memory accesses. So the, these kinds of algorithms are a lot like sort. If you do it, if you do it wrong, you get it's asymptotically slower. And another reason that those performance primitives exist is um, for hardware experts to optimize. So in some cases, you may need to know something about specific hardware features in order to get best performance out of them. And also, we want those performance primitives to be usable by authors of algorithms. And so they need nice, readable, self-documenting names. And the mathematical algorithms that consume these performance primitives those are things that require mathematical expertise to get right, in particular, experts in rounding error analysis. Versus, say, a matrix vector multiply, you might not need to know too much about rounding error analysis to do that, to implement that correctly. But if you're implementing an eigensolver, you do need to understand rounding error analysis really well. And so the idea is that these mathematicians can make their algorithms fast by designing them to spend most of their time in a library that focuses on those performance primitives and thus can go fast. And there's really a, a trade-off in what to decide what goes in this layer one, zero. Um, of course, you want it to be as big as, and featureful as possible. You want everything in there. But you also want implementers to optimize those features. And so if you put too much in layer zero, then you're asking too much of implementers. You're asking too much of vendors. And they won't be able to optimize all the things, and it won't actually be fast, and that's not good either. So there's always that trade-off. And these arguments have been made before. And I'll go into um, the, the history of those arguments and how they were made. They've, they were made 50 years ago, in fact. And I'm paraphrasing here uh, Dodgson and Lewis's paper on, on what it means to extend the, the basic linear algebra subprograms. And I'll explain that in a little bit. And so I'll begin the tour of our standard library um, proposal, um, LinAlg, by example. And I'll go through that matrix multiply example that I showed at the beginning of this talk. And I'll illustrate different features, not only of our library, but how our library relates to um, existing standard library features. And here I've expanded the example a little bit. From the beginning, I only showed the matrix product, which does matrix, matrix multiply. And you could see in the green text at the top under the title what we're computing. It's an updating matrix multiply C equals beta times C plus alpha times A times B transpose, where alpha and beta are scalar values. And so for this matrix product, I have three different matrix views, A, B, and C. And I'm assuming that I've taken the raw pointer that actually stores the data from somewhere, because these MD span that I'm using to represent A, B, and C are non-owning views. So MD span is a feature that was added to C++ 23. And it represents a view of a multidimensional array of elements. There are actually uh, multiple implementations of MD span. And you can use some of them today. Some of them are backported to C++ 14, with some features requiring 17. Um, there's also implementations in progress that are pure C++ 23 implementations. And and so we use MD span to represent multidimensional arrays. Um, MD span is really to our library. MD span is to LinAlg as ranges of iterators are to the C++ standard algorithms. So just like the C++ standard algorithms are algorithms that operate on views of the user's data, um, our library operates on views of the, of the user's data. And so it's really a natural extension of the existing C++ standard algorithms. And when you're building an MD span, it takes a lot of template parameters. There's actually four different template parameters that I'll talk about in a little bit. But um, you can use uh, constructor template argument deduction, CTAD, to make construction for common cases easy. So here I'm just taking my, my const double star, and I'm just handing it to MD span, and I'm giving the, the dimensions of the array m by k, 
to MD, to MD spans constructor, and all the template arguments just, just work. And also, um, if you want to do array slicing, there's something called sub MD span, and I'll, I'll give an example of that later. With MD span, um, we refer to the dimensions collectively as the extents of the array. And this is actually encapsulated with MD span as a type called std extents. And the nice thing about extents is that you can control both the index type, the type of the dimensions, and you can control whether the dimensions are stored at compile time or runtime. So in this example, as you can see on the right inside that green box, the first template argument of extents is int. So that's the type that I'm using to represent the array's dimensions. And the default there is size t, which is a reasonable default for the standard library. But sometimes you want a signed type, and sometimes you want a shorter type or a longer type. And here also in this example, I've encoded the dimensions m and k at compile time. So they're actually template arguments of extents. Um, you can use um, the you could use the number dynamic extent to represent a, a, an extent that's stored at runtime. Um, that kind of all gets defaulted out, or there are aliases. There are ways to type less. And here, they're all compile time values. MDSpan itself has two customization options. This slide is showing the customization option of the layout, and the, I'll show the accessor customization in the next slide. An MDSpan layout is a family of mappings parameterized by extents. A layout mapping is the thing that goes from your i comma j comma k whatever to the one dimensional offset that goes into the array of numbers. And so for example, in C or C++, arrays are row major by default. That's one example of a layout. If for MD span, we spell row major layout right. And in Fortran or in other languages, arrays are column major by default. We spell the column major layout layout left. If you wonder about the left and the right, it's a little bit funny, but the reason for that is that's the, the index in the multidimensional index that is contiguous, and then you go in the opposite direction from that. So layout left, the contiguous index is on the left, the leftmost index. So i comma j, it's the i. And for layout right, the index that's contiguous is the rightmost index, so j. And in this example, I'm, show, I'm showing layout left instead of layout right, which is the default. And a layout is a mapping, a function actually, from the extents to the layout mapping. And so that's why we have this nested type layout left colon colon mapping. So the layout itself is a kind of type function. And you'll notice also, I haven't changed the layouts of B or C here. Um, the LinAlg library doesn't care. It just works. So you can mix your different layouts, and it, and it works, assuming that your layouts fulfill basic uh, requirements of uniqueness. So I talked about the two different customizations of MD span. The first one is layout, and the second one is accessor. The accessor says, how do I get at the element? So once the layout mapping gives me a one-dimensional offset, a number, a size t, how do I take that and the pointer to the data and get the, the thing out, get to it? And with MD span, elements could live in memory, but they don't have to. They could live in memory that's not accessible to the host processor, like, like a, an accelerator's memory. They could live on another computer's memory, remote memory somewhere way over there. They could live on disk. They, they might not live anywhere at all. They might be materialized on demand. And so the accessor controls and facilitates that access to the elements wherever and however they live. It defines the type of the data handle. MD span calls that data handle type. It could be a pointer or it could be something else. And the accessor takes the data handle and the one dimensional offset and maps that to a reference to the element. It also defines the type of that reference. So it could be the usual ampersand kind of reference, or it could be some kind of proxy reference. And on this slide, I show an example of a custom accessor. Here I'm showing something called aligned accessor, which is a separate C++ standard proposal. And aligned accessor uses um, 
um, the existing standard library feature assume aligned, which was added to C20, to express byte over alignment. So instead of my arrays being aligned to size of double, here I want my arrays to be aligned to four times size of double. And there are good reasons to want to do that for performance. So for example, you may want the compiler to be able to vectorize, or you may want to use special SIMD instructions that are four wide. And so this alignment lets you do that. And you can express that in the type using the accessor. And again, the linear algebra library isn't concerned with this accessor being different from the accessors of the other matrices here. B and C here take default accessor as their accessor, which just does what, what you would imagine with a pointer and an offset. It just accesses the pointer at that offset. In the earlier, the first uh, example that I showed you at the beginning of the talk, um, in that library example from Fortran, um, the scalar arguments to matrix multiply and whether or not to take the transpose, those are actual function arguments, actual strings that you give to this Fortran function, hoping and pleading that the representation of strings is the same across the ABI boundary with Fortran. We don't need to do that in C++. I'm, our library represents both of those things, scalar multiplication and the transpose as actual MD span. It's a little bit funny, but you might recall that I mentioned accessors and how a custom accessor can represent different ways of accessing the data. Well, we can represent multiplying every element of an array by a scalar value as an MD span with a different accessor. And we spell this in our library scaled. Scaled of alpha comma A is the MD span consisting of the elements alpha times whatever element A had. And that's a read-only view. You, you don't want to try to like change the elements of that. That would be weird. And similarly for the taking the transposed, transposed of B, that's also an MD span. And this is a classical technique. It's a, for example, if you're implementing a C or C++ thing that calls Fortran and you have row major arrays, uh, people for a long time have been flipping their arrays around and saying, well, I have a row major thing, but if I take the transpose and I flip the dimensions, it becomes a column major thing. So th that's an old technique. And we just take advantage of that technique here. So if you give me a layout right thing, I give you back the transpose of that is a layout left thing with flipped dimensions but I don't have to rearrange the data at all. I'm not like moving elements at all. And if you give me a layout that I don't know, like you could write a custom layout. I've never seen this layout before. What do we do? Well then transposed of that is a nested layout that invokes your layout but flips the, the dimensions. And also there are features for matrices of complex numbers. Um, if you want to take the complex conjugate of each element, that's again a different kind of accessor. And you can mix these things. So people often want to take the conjugate transpose, which means that the transpose and the conjugate of each element. And so we have actually a separate function for that because it's common enough, but it just does the two things. So I talked a little bit about how our proposed library adds to the existing parallel algorithms in C++. And C++17 added the parallel algorithms to the standard library. These parallel algorithms are identified by the fact that they take an execution policy template parameter and argument. And this really expresses the user's promises and intent about, about the elements and the element access functions. So for example, the par on seek um, execution policy in the standard, it, that's the user's way of promising things for example, that it's okay to run on threads other than the calling thread, and that it's okay to interleave operations for vectorization. So for example, the user's not locking locks inside. There are four policies in the standard. There's par, um, unseek, par unseek, and seek, sequential, and vendors can add more. And the fact that vendors can add more policies, that's really an on-ramp to vendor-specific features or vendor-specific performance. So for example, NVIDIA's implementation of the parallel standard algorithms 
has policies to run on a given CUDA stream and or run asynchronously or mix those two things. And the algorithms that we provide in our linear algebra library, those are all parallel algorithms. So I, I show here on the right-hand side that you can pass par unseek to the matrix product and it runs in parallel and can be vectorized. And we actually, our implementation actually exploits this and I'll show some performance results at the end. But, but implementations are not required to exploit this in the standard, but ours does and it would be a common thing for them to do that. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So really the, the heart of the parallel algorithms in the standard library um, is transform and reduce. And transform is, is a, for each element of the thing, um, assigned to an, an element of another thing, the corresponding element of the other thing. So it's like applying a function to each element of an input and writing to an output. And that comes in two different flavors. There's, there's the unary flavor of transform that takes one input sequence and writes to another input output sequence. And then there's the binary version of transform and that combines two different sequences and they're going zipped along concurrently. And the, the other heart of, this, of the parallel algorithms is reduce. Um, reduce adds up or combines all the elements of some sequence into one number. So I've shown uh, in the table on the, on the upper left, I've shown two different flavors of reduce. There's plus reduce, which adds up the numbers, and there's max reduce. Those occur in our, in our um, Linalg library. And you can think of the vector algorithms in, in our Linalg library are really just variants of transform and reduce combined in different way. So for example, if you add two vectors, that's just binary transform. Just element-wise, add them up, assign to the output. If you're taking the norm of a vector, first you have to do a unary transform, so abs, the absolute value of each element, and then you reduce the result into a single value. Now we don't actually have a, like, a temporary vector where we store the absolute value, so it's really the transform underscore reduce algorithm, where the transform, the function that you apply to each element is the absolute value, and then you use max or plus to do the reduction. And if you take the dot product of two vectors, that's a binary transform times, and then a reduce with plus. So for vector algorithms, it's easy to see how those translate into transform and reduce combinations. But the thing that's a little bit trickier and requires some experience with linear algebra is understanding that matrix vector and matrix matrix algorithms are also combinations of transform and reduce. They're really special cases and combinations of all those things together. And a lot of them are really equivalent to wrapping a vector algorithm or a matrix vector algorithm in a transform over one dimension of the array. And for example, on the, on the right side of the screen, on top you see a matrix vector product. I'm writing it in a little bit of a funny way that makes more sense when you understand what it does. So a matrix vector product, um, I'm, I'm summing up the across the rows of A and for each, as I sum across the rows of A, I grow across the elements of X. And so it makes sense to put X on top like that because I'm crossing over X in the same way that I'm crossing over A. And then I'm assigning to each element of Y. And so I've expressed that in the summation notation. And so what I've just described, that's actually a dot product. So for each element of the output, Y, I'm doing a dot product with the row of A and X itself. And so on the lower left, um, you see the dot product formulation of matrix vector multiply. But you can also express this as a bunch of vector adds. And so for each element of the input vector x, I'm doing a scalar multiplication of, of that corresponding column of A with that corresponding element of x, and then assigning the whole vector to y. And so on the lower right, you see that vector add formulation. And there are different reasons to want to do it different ways for performance reasons. Maybe it depends on your layout, depends on how your computer optimizes things. And we rely on linearity to be able to make these transformations and express these operations and break them down in different ways. And 
So that linearity that I talked about at the beginning, it's important that we assume that because the linearity enables optimizations that we want to do on a computer. We want to transform loops in different ways. We may want to use temporary storage. We may even want to use different algorithms. So if our number types have a minus as well as a plus, we can do matrix multiply in a different way. We can use Strassen's algorithm. And so we rely on that linearity for these kinds of transformations. But the important thing to remember is that because of our ability to break down these operations in different ways, we can think of them all as special cases of combinations of transform and reduce. At the beginning of this talk, I'd showed an example of calling a Fortran library. And what is that Fortran library? It's something called the BLAS. The BLAS stands for Basic Linear Algebra Subroutines. The BLAS is a standard Fortran and C library. It's not an ISO standard in the same way that C++ is, a, is an ISO standard, but it's a standard. And it's a standard embraced by industry labs and academia for a long time. And many uh, system vendors, producers of hardware, um, people who sell computers to you, they have optimized BLAS libraries. I list a bunch of different companies there. There are more. And one of our goals with um, the LinAlg library is that you can implement it by calling the BLAS if the types permit, because BLAS only works for certain types. And otherwise, you can fall back to generic C++ code. And when I say that LinAlg is based on the BLAS, that means a few different things. Um, first, it means that the algorithm, the set of algorithms is, is the same, that they have the same kind of functionality. It also means that they have the same essential design. So the BLAS works on views of users' data. And in Fortran and C, you spell view of users' data as array with these dimensions and these strides. And that looks like raw pointers in C. And in C++, that looks like MD spin, but it's the same idea. We're working on views of the user's data. But we're translating them into C++ idioms. And the BLAS history, the history of the BLAS shows the value of using the BLAS as a basis for our library's design, we think. The BLAS has actually 50 years of history as of this year. And it was co-designed with its intended use cases, the layer one algorithms that I had shown you before. The BLAS also evolved with computer architectures. And algorithms that are based on the BLAS are optimal in some formal sense, some provable sense. I show a little bit of the timeline on that, the green timeline below. Um, and it's, it's a long timeline. We're talking about 20 years of BLAS being published as a standard, 50 years of people saying BLAS and talking about a standard. The history of that really begins with a book. That book uh, was published in 1971. And it's called The Handbook for Automatic Computation, Volume 2, Linear Algebra. We can think of this as the grandparent of the BLAS. Um, this book was a compilation of papers. The first paper published in that book was in 1965. And it, the, one of the reviews was said that it was continuous efforts by acknowledged experts over more than 10 years. Um, so I've shown the co-authors and the chief editor of this book um, James Hardy Wilkinson actually worked with Alan Turing on the pilot ACE. And he had been implementing floating point routines and linear algebra functionality on the earliest electronic computers. And this picture shows him with his 1970 Turing Award for doing that. And so by the time he was writing this book, he had been in this field for 25 years. Um, Christian Reinsch is, is an expert also on solving eigenvalue problems um, and, he, and splines, I think. And Friedrich L. Bauer was the chief editor. And he, ha he has an interesting background. He was a, a physicist. He'd worked in quantum mechanics. And he'd also worked in numerical algorithms. And he'd also worked on software engineering and on programming languages and compilers. And he actually contributed to the ALGOL 60 standard and chaired the 1968 NATO Software Engineering Conference, which helped define software engineering. If you ever get to read the minutes of that 1968 conference. You can go uh, web search and find them online. But um, they're really fascinating. There are a lot of great quotes by Alan Perlis in there. And, and, and Professor Bauer didn't say a whole lot in there, but what he said was really, really good quotes. So take a look at that, at the minutes for that.
So the handbook was written in ALGOL 60. It was a, a great uh, programming language standard of the time. A lot of cool features in ALGOL 60 made it into languages much later. They were almost too far ahead of their time. But because of that, nobody had access to an ALGOL 60 compiler. They're just, that wasn't a thing. There were maybe a few of them, but most installations didn't have them. And there were concerns about optimization. And so what did you have to do if you wanted to implement those algorithms? You had to implement them in the language at hand, which was Fortran 66 at the time. Or Fortran 4 was the, the language that people had in implementations. Fortran 66 was the, the standard for Fortran. And so the first project to implement the handbook was IcePack. IcePack focused on the hard problems. Most people already had linear system solvers. The algorithms were pretty well understood at the time. And so IcePack focused on eigenvalue solvers and singular value solvers. And so IcePack 1 was written in 1971 to 1972. And the experience of implementing these algorithms showed people that there were certain routines, certain functionality that really needed to be fast in order for IcePack to be fast. And these were these functions that kept popping up over and over again, this performance primitives layer. And so by 1973 already, there was a draft BLAS, a draft proposal for functions that go in the BLAS. And those are functions focused on vector operations. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that was later. And already people were talking about a standard. So there were two meetings to standardize, 1974, in 1975, and the, the proposal was essentially fixed by 1975. And as a result, LinPack was the package that came out that wanted to solve linear systems and linear least squares problems. So IcePack and LinPack together meant to complete the implementation of the handbook. And LinPack, already having a BLAS at hand, was specifically written to use this BLAS. And so um, um, it was finished, the first edition of LinPack was finished in 1979. And the BLAS1 publication, the paper that proposed the BLAS, came out in 1979. And the LinPack user's guide includes, at the end of it, there's a little benchmark that solves a linear system using algorithms that spend most of their time in the BLAS. And you may have heard of something called the LinPack benchmark. And if you haven't heard of it, you may have heard of something called the top 500, this list of the fastest computers in the world. And so Jack Dongera, um, 19, uh, 2021 Turing Award winner. He was heavily involved in the development of LinPack. He was actually an intern, like a graduate student intern. And, and his name is, is inextricably associated with benchmarking in the top 500. And so he cut his teeth on LinPack. That was really how it all started. And you may know a little bit, if you know a little bit about the BLAS, you may know that the BLAS occurs in different levels. I talked about vector operations and matrix vector operations and matrix matrix operations. And those levels are tied in with the evolution of the BLAS in the, in the 1970s and the 1980s. And so the BLAS of the 1970s focused a lot on just vector operations, dot products, vector norms, vector sums, plane rotations. And why was that? Well, Blas was focused on how do I get my code to go fast on the machines of the time, and the machines of the time were mainframes. So, for example, uh, the, the IcePack uh, authors were very much interested in the UNIVAC uh, 1108, which was a 1970 machine. Here I'm showing a photo of that in the US Census Bureau office. They were interested in that machine. They were interested in IBM 360 variants, big mainframes. And how do you get code to go fast on a mainframe? The compilers weren't always so good. And so people found that you had to hand optimize some key loops in assembly language. And so you needed to know about the architecture and become an expert in the architecture. And, and so that's, that motivated the original BLAS to focus on those key loops that needed to be optimized. Now as computer architectures evolved, the BLAS evolved with it. And when I say BLAS level, that actually means three different things. First of all, it means the order in which that edition of the BLAS was published. So the first BLAS, the BLAS 2, the BLAS 3. It also roughly means the number of nested loops in a textbook sequential implementation of the algorithm. So if I'm writing a textbook um, vector dot product, it's a single nested loop. 
If I'm writing a matrix vector product, it's two nested loops. If I'm writing a matrix matrix multiply, it's three nested loops, the reduction for each element of the matrix. And the funny thing about vector computers, so as computers evolved from mainframes, um, you may have heard of Cray and the supercomputers of the 70s. Um, I show a picture here of Seymour Cray next to the Cray 1, which came out in 1976. And the, the, these vector computers really dominated supercomputing and fast computers through the late 70s and the early to mid 80s and even into the 90s a little bit. And despite the name vector computers, to get really good performance on vector computers, you can't just think of one vector at a time. You really have to fuse vector operations. You have to do more than one thing at a time. And that amortizes the latency of launching a vector operation. It maximizes the structural level parallelism and it improves a reuse of your precious vector registers, which you didn't have a lot of. And as I showed you that picture earlier of the different ways to implement a matrix vector product. So just like you can decompose a matrix vector product into a lot of vector operations, you could go the opposite way. You could take a lot of vector operations and you could turn them into a single matrix vector operation. And so fusing loops, the linear algebra way of saying that is matrix vector operations. And so the BLAS2 includes matrix vector operations, outer products, which involve a matrix and a vector, triangular solves, which are the triangular matrix and vectors. And so the BLAS2 uh, proposal came out in, the paper actually came out in 1988, but people had been working on it throughout the 80s. Simultaneously, there was something happening in computer architectures. So the arithmetic performance of, um, of consumer architectures grew really fast. You may have heard the Weird Al song, It's All About the Pentiums, 1999 song. Um, in 1991, there was a New York Times article called The Killer Micros. And what were the killer micros doing? They were killing Cray supercomputers because suddenly this thing that was on your desk if you just waited three more years and bought the next one, it was gonna be faster than that bazillion dollar thing in the back room. And, and that thing in the back room, yeah, you didn't wanna, it was starting to look attractive to just buy the next thing. And there are really two aspects of this killer micro evolution. The first aspect was the evolution of parallel distributed memory parallel computers. And so here I'm showing the Connection Machine 2. It's got all kinds of colorful lights on it. It looks really cool. Like, I think they, they hired some like graphic designers, artists to design it so that it would look good. And dis distributed memory parallel computers, um, they started to come out in the early 80s and they really became more and more popular in the 90s. And when you have a bunch of little tiny computers that are communicating all the time, what you really want to do is you want to maximize data reuse and minimize communication by designing your algorithms so that they have a low surface to volume ratio. The surface is the data that you share in common with your friend processors next to you, and the volume, that's the data that you operate on. And so you want the least surface, the most volume. And the thing that happened concurrently with consumer architectures was the the arithmetic performance was getting faster, but the memory was not getting correspondingly faster. And so memory hierarchies got deeper, it got slower and slower to access memory, but faster and faster to do arithmetic. And so the same thing that's good for distributed memory parallel computers, the, the surface to volume ratio effect, started happening with sequential consumer processors because of the memory hierarchy. And so the same phenomenon was happening that you wanted to have a low surface to volume ratio. And this evolution of computers, the, the dual evolution of consumer processors getting deeper memory hierarchies, having faster arithmetic and slower memory relatively, and distributed memory parallel computing where you need to worry about the performance of communication, those two effects have really come together in modern computers. So modern fast computers 
in terms of performance are described by this right-hand side that's highlighted in green. And so uh, Professor Kathy Yellick of UC Berkeley has the phrase, flops are free, arithmetic is free, bandwidth is money, latency is physics. So having fast memory is expensive, but ultimately you can't solve the problem that you have to go there and you're constrained by the speed of light. And the BLAS 3, level 3 of the BLAS, it was really designed to perform well for, for this low surface to volume ratio regime. So matrix matrix multiply has the most locality of all these operations. And other kinds of matrix matrix operations, they're actually, in terms of their memory performance, they're equivalent to uh, matrix matrix multiply. That's really the heart of the BLAS3. And so the, the fact that modern processors behave in this way, that's why BLAS3 is still relevant. And so you might ask, well, is there ever going to be a BLAS4? Like, if matrix matrix multiply is, is good, is there something that's even better? And it turns out that, at least for the use cases of linear algebra, that's not really necessary. So BLAS is a stable interface. It forms a building blocks for provably efficient algorithms. The BLAS actually lasted through two waves of algorithms, two generations of algorithms. And I had mentioned the 1971 handbook. Each one of those ways effectively updated the handbook. And um, so in the 1980s and 90s, um, LAPAC, the Fortran library, came out with its block algorithms. And those had to be proven correct with respect to rounding error. They're radically different algorithms than the ones in the handbook. They were restructured to use BLAS3 more efficiently. And in the 2000s and 2010s, another wave of algorithms came out called a communication avoiding algorithm. And those are even better at exploiting BLAS3 kinds of computational operations. And those communication avoiding algorithms were proven optimal in some theoretical sense. They, they minimize data movement, they maximize parallelism given constraints on rounding error. And <clears throat> you can see our Octonumerica article from 2014 summarizes a lot of different kinds of communication avoiding algorithms and shows that they're um, optimal. And because of that optimality, um, we don't foresee the need for a BLAS4. We think the BLAS3 is perfectly fine. And so I'm going to end the talk with a detailed example. Um, I'm going to talk about Cholesky matrix factorization. And who is André Louis Cholesky? He was actually a French artillery officer. And you might wonder what artillery has to do with linear algebra. Well, it turns out if you want the artillery shell to go where you want it to go, and not where you don't want it to go. You need to know something about the curvature and the shape of the Earth. And you need to have a good map, a three-dimensional map of the Earth. And so that, was, that explains his interest in mathematics and in measuring the Earth. Um, geodesy is that field. And so Cholesky, he came up with a way for solving um, symmetric positive definite linear systems. And sy symmetry means that the matrix is the same when you flip it over the diagonal. So you can see. In that image of the matrix on the right, at that green box, that's the diagonal of the matrix. And the, thing, the part of the matrix below that is the lower triangle. The part of the matrix above that is the upper triangle. And you can decide, you have to say whether the upper or lower triangle includes the diagonal. Generally, it does. And to say that a matrix is symmetric means when I flip it over the diagonal, when I reverse the indices, it's, it's the same. The values are the same. And to say that a matrix is positive definite means that um, the, the, the inner product that the matrix forms is always positive as long as you give it vectors that are, that are non-zero. So the x transpose times a times x for any non-zero vector x is positive. And sym uh, symmetric positive definite matrices occur a lot in applications. It's a common matrix structure that linear algebra is very good at exploiting. And Cholesky's method factors the matrix A into two parts. It factors it into a lower, a lower triangular matrix L and the same matrix L transposed. So the product of a matrix with a transpose of itself. And the reason we want to do that is it reduces the problem to solving two triangular systems. First, solving a triangular system LC equals B for some vector C and then L transpose X equals C, and that X is the solution that we want. 
Solving triangular systems is a lower complexity. It's um, order number of entries in the matrix, so n squared, whereas solving a linear system generally is um, n cubed uh, for the methods that I'm talking about here. And also you can reuse this factorization for different right-hand sides b, so it's a useful thing to have in hand. And at the bottom of the slide, I show an example of a Cholesky factorization. Um, you can see the, the, on the left is the lower triangular matrix L, then I flip that L over, that's L transpose, and then the original matrix is on the right. You might ask how I know whether it's positive definite, the matrix A, and it turns out the, um, in this, it's a little bit overkill to use Gershgren's circle theorem for this, but if you're familiar with that, that's, that's what I'm using. So the, essentially the, the elements on the diagonal are so much bigger than the elements off the diagonal in the same row and column that I know that it's positive definite. A key feature of our library is that symmetry is an algorithm. It's not a data structure. There's no special symmetric matrix type. There's no class symmetric matrix. It's just an algorithm. And so we're only reading the lower or the upper triangle. In this case, we're, we're going to read just the lower triangle of the matrix. And we interpret the matrix as symmetric by interpreting the part of the matrix that we don't read. So we only look at L, the lower triangle, but we don't look at the other part of the matrix and we just say, well, our algorithm interprets it as symmetric, so we're just gonna assume things about that. And so there are different named algorithms in our library for different matrix structures. There's symmetric, there's Hermitian, there's triangular, and, but we don't have a symmetric matrix class or a Hermitian matrix class or a triangular matrix class. And idiomatically, that doesn't even make sense because, for example, if I'm solving an unsymmetric linear system using factorization, I start with a, a, met, a square matrix that's not triangular at all. I work on it in place, and then in place, I have two matrices, L and U. And so I'm reinterpreting. So triangleness, symmetry, those are reinterpretations of the data. I'll start with the signature of our function. Um, I'm calling it Cholesky factor. Cholesky can actually fail so if, if the matrix is not positive definite, Cholesky will detect that. And so this function returns null opt on success. Otherwise, it returns the least index where this pivot, A of KK, so the, the diagonal entry where, where I encounter a pivot that's zero or nan, something bad. And so Cholesky can fail. I want to make sure that's reflected. Also, um, I'm, the library uh, linalg uses uh, MDSpan to represent a view of the matrix elements. It's a view. There's no container. There's no copies. There's no allocation. Factorizations idiomatically modify the data in place. So I take the matrix A and I overwrite it with a result. And looking at the template parameters here, these are the template parameters for the MDSpan for the view of the matrix. Value type here is the type for which a of R comma C is a reference, so the type of the entries. Um, the algorithms in our library work for any types that smell of number, that have the right kind of numbery kind of interface. We have a formal way of saying that. Um, here I want value type to be non-const. That's the requires clause there. So I want to be able to write to the entries. It's an in-place factorization, so I can't have const. I can't have an MD span of const T. You can have MD span of const t. That, re that represents a matrix whose elements are const. And that's, that's a good thing to have sometimes, but not here. <clears throat> the, um, the ext0 and ext1, those are the extents, the dimensions of the MD span. Either or both can be runtime or compile time values. And also I'm templating here on the layout and accessor. Um, the algorithms in our library are generic on how we arrange and store the matrix as elements. The layout has to be unique, though. Otherwise, we don't know how to write to it. There are non-unique layouts in MDSpan. Think about what that means, but we do allow them. An example of one would be the constant matrix, where every element maps to the same offset, so it's just one number. And that's a, that's a valid MDSpan, but it's not what we want here. So I'd mentioned that there's no symmetric matrix type or layout. Symmetry is just an interpretation of the data. 
In this case, we're only accessing the lower triangle of the matrix. And the factorization reinterprets the matrix A on output as a lower triangular matrix L. So I'm gonna go through this a little bit fast so that there's time for questions. Um, the point is this is a recursive algorithm. And the function body reads like a description of the algorithm, which is very attractive to us. So I'll, this is the base case. I'm not too worried about the base case. Here's the recursion step. And what I'm doing here is I'm partitioning the matrix into two equal submatrices, approximately equal, and I'm not accessing the, the upper triangle. And I talked about sub MD span. Here I'm using sub MD span to slice the matrix, to create views of different parts of the matrix. I then recursively factor the upper left block, the A11 block, in place. I then solve um, for the A21 block, the lower left block. And I do that using triangular matrix right solve which is a function in our library. Um, I'm using the transpose here, so I'm solving with using the transpose of the matrix. And because it's the transpose, it's upper triangle, upper triangular. And I'm overwriting the result in place. Um, the explicit diagonal tag, that's the opposite of implicit unit diagonal, which we use for other factorizations. Oops. Um, then I overwrite the, I do the, the sure complement uh, where I overwrite the lower right block with something which is a symmetric outer product. And so I talked about symmetric algorithms. This is an example of one of those. And then I recursively factor the lower right block. And then I'm done. And this is for solving the linear system using the result of the factorization. It's just two lines, two triangular matrix solves. And I have some performance results here. The point of these performance results is not, oh, wow, our library is super fast. The point of the performance results here is our library just dispatches to an existing vendor-optimized BLAS library. On the left, we have uh, performance on our, um, on our Hopper GPUs. On the right, we have performance on an Intel CPU using open BLAS. And the point is the two lines are the same. And just to summarize, um, our linear algebra library is a C++ linear algebra library. It offers performance primitives. It encapsulates hardware-specific optimizations, lets mathematicians use it to focus on algorithm development. We think it's an idiomatic C++ interface, but still, still a BLAS interface, still based on the BLAS. And we think the BLAS is a good basis. Um, you can see our implementations. Uh, uh, NVIDIA has an implementation that calls KuBLAS. There's a reference implementation. And to learn more, you can look at our proposals. Please feel free to contact me. Thank you all very much. I'd be happy to take any questions. I see some hands. Uh, come up, if you could come up to a microphone, that would be excellent. And I'll try to repeat your question too. Hi. Hey, thanks for the talk. Thank uh, you. I was just uh, wondering, you said earlier that uh, doing the transpose was just changing the accessor. Uh, so instead of going row, uh, row by row, you're going column by column. Uh, but you're not actually changing how the memory is laid out. You're just changing how you're accessing it. Um, so the transpose is actually a different layout, not a different accessor? Different la layout, <coughs> yes. Yeah. Correct. Uh, some uh, algorithms are very dependent on how you manage to, like if you stay in cache, going over it uh, row by row versus column by column is different. Is there a way to force it to do that transpose? So um, the, our library does have a copy. <clears throat> so if you want to do an explicit transpose, you can copy um, from a matrix with one layout to a matrix with another layout. Okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. Good question though, thank you. Uh, are we gonna back and forth? Let, let's do that side first, hold on. Sorry. Thank you for the talk. I have two questions, uh -huh. if you don't mind. First one, then did you check if uh, this uh, like high-level C++ interface uh, adds a new overhead on top of uh, BLAS interface? We did. There, uh, it, it doesn't. <laughs> well, so this is, that, that's a bit of a short answer. The longer answer is, if your problem is very small, you probably don't want to call the BLAS. You don't want the library to dispatch to a Fortran library. 
But the nice thing is if your problem is small, you could probably tell me the, the dimensions at compile time. And so a reasonable optimization for our library to do is if we see that you give us compile time dimensions, we shouldn't try to dispatch to a Fortran or C library. We should just do something different. And so if the place, the, the place where overhead matters of Studley knowledge calling a blas is where the matrices are small. Because for large matrices, it's all eaten by the computation. And so there it's, however, if the matrices are small, generally the user can help me by telling me that the matrices are small. Okay. Is, is, that, is that kind of an answer? Mm, yes, thank you. Okay. Second uh -huh. one. You mentioned that symmetric isn't like a type of matrix, but to me it sounds, sounds like it could be a useful annotation or something for a matrix. Like we have GSL non-null annotation for a pointer. Uh-huh. So we tried to follow the idioms of the blahs as much as possible. And the idiom of the blahs is that symmetry is, is an interpretation. And that starts to matter a lot when you are doing factorizations. Because you might start, for example, you start with, if you're doing LU factorization, you start with a matrix A, not symmetric, not triangular, nothing. Then you factor it and you get two triangular matrices that overlap in the same space. Or if you factor a symmetric matrix A, you get L, L transpose, but those are two triangular matrices that occupy the same space. So it's not, your symmetric matrix, you changed it in place, and now it's not symmetric anymore. It's something else. Yeah, but you could return like uh, two MD spans annotated as triangular. That's not really the idiom of the blas. Okay. Yeah, Thanks. but it's a good question. Thank you. Take that side. Hi. Cool. So yeah, this was awesome presentation and a nice Thanks. little history. So that was really uh -huh. neat. Um, I have two questions. Uh -huh. uh, one is the API here seems to be more C style, so like all free function based. So what uh -huh. was the design decision with using that sort of API versus OOP or you know, a class style? And my other question would be, uh, do you have any benchmarks on how this compares to other popular open source uh, matrix libraries like Eigen or something like that in terms of overall performance for these operations? Sure. Um, so just to answer the first question, our model was not only the blahs, but also the standard algorithms. And the standard algorithms are free functions, essentially, templated functions. And the idea is that they are stateless and they operate on views of your data. And the, just as a range of iterators is the input of a, of a standard algorithm, an MD span is the input of our algorithm. Okay. And to answer the second question, we haven't done that comparison. That's a good thing to do. But the hope is that, I know Eigen, Eigen doesn't just have call the blahs, it also has its own kernels. And the hope is that generally, if, if, you're, if you understand an architecture, you should be able to get close to peak performance when you implement matrix multiply. So the hope, as long as the overhead of the library encapsulation is not too bad, it should perform the same, I would say. But Eigen also has issues like, in Eigen, I can say A equals A times A. And Eigen has to allocate temporary storage because it can't do that as an expression template. Yeah, if you do like times equals versus equals, you get temporaries and other yeah, unexpected behavior that's definitely not obvious. So. Right. So, so, yeah, it depends on what you're doing in Eigen, but yeah. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's high. Uh, hi. All of the examples you've shown in here were all using dense matrices. Uh, has any work or thought gone into sparse matrices? So, um, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, MD span is not really the right data structure or the right interface to represent a sparse matrix. And there are a few different reasons for that, but it's really a dense thing. Um, so also the kinds of things that you want to do with sparse matrices are sometimes different. So for example, the interface for a sparse matrix matrix multiply, you have to know how much space you need for the output so that you can pre-allocate storage. And so it's a different kind of interface that doesn't fit so well with the blahs kind of interface. I could imagine, like for example, you could encapsulate it in a very high level way, but then you wouldn't be able to achieve the goal of separating out allocation from computation, which is a major goal of our interface, that we don't have to allocate, there's no allocation happening in terms of the user's data. So thank you. Um, no. Oh, that side. 
Hey, right, so I think I should kind of answer some of my, my question, but just trying to kind of round it up a little bit. So when you talk about layouts, about having custom layouts, does uh -huh. that mean that you can basically implement anything? So, and that kind of feeds a little bit to your previous answer about sparse matrix. So can you actually abuse layouts to implement the sparse matrix, for example? Yes, Con but, but it's, it is an abuse. Okay. And, so uh, the, the, the short answer is, of the layout and the accessor should be uncoupled. And if you find yourself being tempted to couple them, you're abusing the design. Okay, and I, I think you probably answered my, my second question, but I'm just trying to kind of understand, um, I mean, to some extent, BLAS and you know, kind of any low level structure, they kind of assume some contiguity of data and some structure, whereas in this case, you, you provide more freedom in terms of how, kind of how the data is being represented. The idea is that this thing should always be kind of blast compatible, or can you actually just kind of have some, again, some exotic representation of the data? In that case, how do you, how do you address like algorithm performance? And I'm thinking like, for, for example, things like contiguous iterators are one example, right? In a place where in the C++ standard felt the need to specify this thing actually maps to a contiguous block of memory, whereas mm -hmm. this thing doesn't. So do you have that notion here? Is that relevant to the space? So um, that was actually important to us. And so, for example, our proposal, um, P2642, the padded MD span layouts, specifically addresses that the BLAS accepts a bigger range of layouts than layout right and layout left. Mm -hmm. But generally, the library permits other layouts. And what we want to do there is not restrict implementations from optimizing for, for other kinds of layouts. And we, we want it to work. So just like the parallel algorithms don't have to be parallel, they can fall back. Um, the, the algorithms in this proposal can also fall back to a generic implementation if they have to. So they don't require BLAS compatibility. But is there, is there a way to pass that information? I mean, is the underlying algorithm aware that this data structure is BLAS friendly or is not? That allows you to have that fallback. The layout and the accessor expresses BLAS friendliness. Okay, cool. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Nick, other side? Hey, uh, yeah, thank you for the talk. It was fascinating. Um, so. One thing that I'm wondering about in full disclosure, I'm not somebody that does very much with linear algebra. Like I know of the BLAS um, and I've actually had to debug the uh, LAPAC build previously and the linking and stuff in yeah. the course of my work. Um, but so what I'm wondering is, is that like basically the fact that we're basically wrapping the BLAS, like is the assumption there just that there has been so much hand optimization that has gone into this library over the course of decades that we can't possibly expect to beat it. Um, or I guess I'm just wondering, like it seems like, you know, like ha having like a self-hosting implementation in C++ might be m kind of a nice way to start to like transition away from the Fortran legacy. And so I'm just kind of wondering what the thought is there. And if it's just we can't beat the performance, then that makes sense. But So the thought is pragmatic in the sense that many vendors already have a BLAS in hand and an easy way to implement this efficiently would be to wrap their, their BLAS. But that doesn't necessarily imply Fortran or C. You could write a, a, a pure C++ implementation of this that performs at peak. Okay, all right, so actually maybe I'm thinking of Fortran specific like instantiations of the BLAS then, would that be accurate? Right, so a lot of vendors have C BLAS mm -hmm. and so it would, a very reasonable way to implement our proposal would be to dispatch to a CBLAS if the types permit. But it did, so it doesn't have to be Fortran. Okay, all right, thank you very much. No problem, uh-huh. Stop me when I'm, when I'm out of time. That's that? Uh, cool. Hey, thanks. Um, the indirection, basically the, the MD span where you can kind of say, oh, well, it's been transposed and it's multiplied by a scalar. Um, that's kind of like a fancy accessor. Does that play well with the BLAS interface? I mean, it would kind of seem like you're almost uh, going to be passing into the Fortran uh, almost like a callback or something like, hey, if you need element three comma four, call us, we'll go get it for you, possibly over the network or transposing or whatever. Or do you have to flatten things down to an actual in-memory representation before you pass off to the BLAS? So the usual, the implementation, if you have an existing BLAS, Fortran BLAS or C BLAS. Sure. The usual implementation is if I can call the BLAS, do it. Otherwise, don't. Okay. So, yeah, if I need some kind of, if it's a custom accessor, sure. I can't call the BLAS. Oh. Like, for, like, for example, there's an atomic right. accessor proposal okay. that uses atomic ref as the reference type. Ah. 
that's not going to work with the Fortran blobs. Sure. So you, you don't do the Fortran blobs. But you could do something else, and it's kind of up to the vendor to do something fast. OK. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you see the path for adoption for existing code? So like for those already using iGen or other libraries, they usually like full buy-in. You use their library, uh, their types for data representation, for basic algebra, for higher level functions. So I would say if you're using Eigen and it's working for you, Eigen is a higher level. So I talked at the beginning about the levels of linear algebra. Eigen is really a full stack solution. And if it's working for you, I don't think a user of Eigen should have to worry about this. Maybe an Eigen implementer could decide to use this proposal. If it, if it enters the C++ standard, it would make sense. But I don't think that's something that an Eigen user should have to worry about. Eigen user should just create an Eigen matrix and solve the linear system. Yeah. And the last question. So you were showing benchmarking, comparing basically GPU and CPU. Uh -huh. How is it possible basically to decide, on a, like for me as a programmer, I want like certain thing, like I know, convert, like a, apply kernel to an image. I want it to be on a GPU. How would I achieve that? Oh, wait, I'm not sure I understand your question. Could you elaborate? Oh, yes. Yeah. So how I can decide or influence where my code will be executed, like on GPU oh. versus CPU? I see. So um, the existence of GPUs is, is not standard C++. The fact that you can go over there and do that. And so, but the, the nice thing is that the standard parallel algorithms give vendors an escape hatch, a way to express this. So at NVIDIA's implementation has a, an implementation-specific execution policy. So instead of par unseek, you can say, run on the GPU with this CUDA stream, and it will do that. And, and also, there are compiler flags. So for example, if you use um, NVC++, the former PGI compiler, if you give it the compiler flag that says, I want par unseek to run on the GPU, then par unseek and par will run on the GPU. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Yes, uh, so if I missed this, then I apologize. But uh, this is you know, intended for the standard. So in your conversation so far, what are the biggest uh, obstacles or objections that you're facing? And also, how would you rate the prospects for C++ 26, 29? Thank you. Um, so the, the, this proposal is currently in library uh, wording review. So it's, it's at the last level of review before a plenary vote. And so the, the hope is that um, we can get it into C++26. Awesome. Yeah, and I, I think the objections, I want people to read the proposal. And there's a lot of proposal. It's long. It seems longer than it is because I like to write words that aren't wording. Like I like, I like to write motivation and I like to and so a lot of the beginning of the proposal is motivation, not wording. You're more of a dense matrix kind of guy than a sparse matrix. I, I get it. <laughs> I'm a dense wording kind of guy. And also, a lot of the wording is very repetitive. We actually asked LWG if we needed the synopsis, because like, the synopsis doubles the length of the proposal. Most of the proposal is very repetitive and doesn't have a lot of wording. And so it's a lot longer than it seems. There's a lot of overloads that kind of do all the same thing. So don't be scared that, don't try to print it because you'll kill a lot of trees. But don't be scared to read it. And there's also a companion paper called um, P1674. And that's meant to show why, why did we do this? And I think reading that paper is helpful too. But thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You done? I think we're done. Thank you.